Nonverbal communication is all around us. We see it in facial expressions, eye contact, hand and body gestures. It includes the use of space, time, smells, and touch. It includes the clothing we wear and even vocal characteristics we use when we speak. In this lecture, we're going to learn what nonverbal communication is, its characteristics, how we use it, and 10 different types of nonverbal communication. Basically, nonverbal communication is all the communication but the words. It's behaviors and characteristics that convey meaning, but no use of words. These include tone of voice, eye contact, how we use space, our body language and gestures, our clothing, our use of time, our touch, and our smell. And there's many more than that. When it comes to communication, there's some characteristics of nonverbal communication that are almost always there or unique about it. First of all, nonverbal communication is present in almost all contexts. When we're face to face with someone, we watch their facial expressions, their gestures, and their eye contact, and it gives meaning to the conversation. When we're on the phone, we listen to changes in someone's voice to add meaning to their words. While not necessarily officially nonverbal communication, in text and other textual forms, we try to add nonverbals through emojis, emoticons, and even memes. What's interesting is that we think of words as communicating most of our information. But all the studies show that nonverbals communicate more than verbal communication. In fact, research has shown that nonverbal communication accounts for 65 to up to 90% of the information we gain from an interaction. One of the reasons for this is that there's many different channels of nonverbal communication. So there's your tone of voice, your gestures, your eyes, your clothing way more than just the words. Another characteristic of nonverbal communication is that it's believed over verbal communication. For example, we're all aware of times when people tell us something's fun and based on their facial expressions, the tone of their voice, or their body language, we know that fun is not really fun. We've learned that when the verbal and the nonverbal contradict, we believe the nonverbal. Nonverbal communication is also the primary way we express our emotion. Most emotion is expressed through facial expressions and our voice. In fact, Paul Ekman, in his study of facial expressions, has discovered that there's six basic emotions that are shared across different cultures. They're happiness, fear, disgust, anger, sadness, and surprise. Relative to our voice, it is considered one of the most accurate nonverbal channels. We read the sounds of people's voice, their voices, and their changes better than anything. For example, if I get loud, I'm either excited or angry, but you usually know the difference. Nonverbal communication also metacommunicates. What does that mean? It means it tells us about the communication itself, how to interpret it. So if we go back to our discussion of fine, the body language, the eye contact, the gestures told us what to think about that fine. It metacommunicated to us. Nonverbal communication serves many functions relative to helping us communicate. First of all, nonverbal communication functions along with verbal communication. It repeats it, it accents it, it complements it by adding meaning. Sometimes it can contradict it, sometimes it can be substituted in place of verbal communication, and sometimes it regulates and controls interactions. It helps us to manage conversations. For example, when we become disinterested in a conversation, we look away to indicate that we're ready to not talk about that topic. Or we can put our hand up to ask someone to stop. 
Nonverbal communication also helps us to maintain relationships. We might hold hands with someone we love. We might put our arm lovingly around a friend. Nonverbal communication also helps us form impressions of others and them form impressions of us. They look at our facial expressions, our sounds, our dress, and how we carry our body. We can use nonverbal communication to influence what other people think of us. By the way we talk, the words we use, the clothes, we can impact others' impressions of us. So now we're going to look at some different channels of communication and some great and interesting research about each of these channels. First, let's discuss kinesics. That's body movements, including postures, gestures, and Professor Bernhardt includes facial expressions. We can use kinesics to communicate liking of someone. So we lean forward to them, we open up our body to them, we have direct eye contact, we smile, we get close to them, and we touch them. Kinesics has also been shown to sometimes indicate status. For example, the boss might have bigger gestures and more relaxed postures. He might even put his feet up on the desk. As you remember earlier, we use facial expressions to express the primary amount of our emotion. Relative to facial expressions, the one that we almost never miss on someone's face is anger. Ocalistics is the study of eye behavior or eye contact. We can use eye contact to signal attraction by kind of sideways looking at someone. We can gain credibility by looking someone in the eye or we can dominate them by staring at them. One thing to note is that eye contact is very cultural. In the U.S., we believe looking someone in the eye is a sign of respect. In other, particularly Mideastern cultures, looking someone in the eye can be considered rude and disrespectful. In fact, in the United States, we have the most eye contact of most any culture. Another type of nonverbal communication is haptics. We know this better as touch or the study of touch. Touch is always considered some type of invasion of privacy. It's either accepted or not accepted. Touch is culturally bound. In fact, in the United States, we touch the least of most all cultures. Because it involves privacy and it's not something we do often, touch is basically a hot potato in our society and can lead to many misinterpretations. The irony in this is that there's a great deal of research that shows that touch is related to good health and being touched is important to a person. There's been a ton of research done on touch and I'll share just a bit of it here. In our society, women are touched more than men. And that's a good thing because women value touch more than men. When it comes to families, mothers are more likely to touch their female children than their male ch children. In the workplace, it's more likely to be the higher status individual that initiates touch. But this is really dangerous because of sexual harassment. The thing to remember about touch is that it should be used with care because it is very difficult to understand and can lead to lots of problems. Vocalics are characteristics of the voice that communicate meaning. This is sometimes called paralanguage. So it's everything about the voice but the word. Paralinguistics includes all non-word sounds like uh, mm, it includes silence, it includes the pitch or how high or low your voice is. It includes how fast you speak or the rate of your voice, your inflection, your volume, your pronunciation, your enunciation, and your articulation. Everything but the words. Studies have shown vocal cues to be associated with how physically attractive you are, your credibility, your emotional state, 
your gender character characteristics, and your personality, and even certain stereotypes. We've all encountered times when we spoke to someone on the phone and had one image of them, and then when we met them in person, they were far different than what we thought of their voice. This is vocalics in action. Another form of nonverbal communication is olfactus. That's the study of smell. And it's shown that memory and sexual attraction are strongly related to smell. Smells bring to life certain memories from our past. They're basically embedded in our brain and bring forth the sensations and feelings associated with that memory. There's also a huge amount of research that indicates smell plays an important role in sexual attraction. It shows that we are attracted to people that have a different body smell from our own. Proxemics is the study of space and how we use space. Proxemics is cultural like touch and eye contact. In the United States, we like to take up more space for our personal space, and we tend to inhabit more territory around ourselves. Edward T. Hall discovered that in Western cultures, we have certain personal spaces in which we're comfortable with interacting with others. For close relationships with good friends, family members, and romantic partners, we will typically be comfortable being zero to one and a half feet apart. For general friends and general relatives, we'll typically stay about one and a half to four feet apart. For customer relationships, a casual acquaintance and people that we don't know very well, we become more formal and maintain a further distance of about four to 12 feet apart. Then there's public space, and this is when a presenter is performing in front of an audience or speaking in front of an audience. They're far enough away that they can be seen, but they're really not that close to the audience in general. You can see the concept of space at work in an elevator. If we get on an elevator, no one's on it. We tend to go ahead and stand in the middle of the elevator. If we then add someone else to the elevator, we tend to move to accommodate other people. We're not going to go and stand right beside them. We're going to adjust bodies as people get on the elevator to keep our personal space. Another type of use of space is territoriality. That's when we establish spaces as our own. The first type of territoriality is primary territoriality. These are actual things that are our spaces that we own, such as our car, our house, our room. The second type of territoriality is secondary space. This is when we own space in public and we often protect it with bags, pins, and other barriers we create. You've experienced this secondary territoriality if you've ever walked into class after a few weeks of class and found someone else sitting in your seat. Another type of nonverbal communication is how we communicate about how we use time. This is called chronemics. People can either be on time or late or not on time or more flexible at time. And there's communication around this time behavior. For example, in the United States, it's okay for the higher status person to be late to a meeting, but never the lower status person. So in other words, I could be late to class, but it's a bigger deal if you're late to class. We also all are familiar with what it communicates when, when we're spending our time with someone, we're talking, and they're on their cell phone instead of listening to us. This is all about how we spend time. The final type of nonverbal communication we're going to talk about is objectics. This is clothing and artifacts that we use that communicate things about us. In our society, we use many artifacts and clothing to communicate our identity and our status, from jewelry to hair to autos to offices to houses. 
most of the research in this area is not going to come as a big surprise to you. Clothing impacts first impressions of us. It impacts what people perceive as our status. Conforming to styles means we want to be accepted or like, or it can also be that we want to be popular. There's also some interesting research on tattoos. The research shows that men with tattoos are considered more dominant. That's probably not a surprise. However, women with tattoos are considered less healthy, so they're considered to be a health risk. Surprising research. As we come to an end of this discussion of nonverbal communication, I want to remind you that there's many more channels of nonverbal communication. Color, music, all kinds of things. In fact, one area of nonverbal communication that's truly interesting is how we're beginning to use random symbols, capitalization, images, abbreviations, emoticons, and emojis, and text messages. I also want to remind you that nonverbal communication is very cultural and different in different cultures, and it's also sometimes different between men and women. For example, when it comes to the emotions of joy, affection, fear, and shame, women are more expressive than men. Contrastingly, many studies have shown that men express anger outwardly more than women, although there's some studies that show that it's the same. Finally, let's discuss some ways that you can refine your nonverbal communication skills. The first thing to do is to be sensitive and pay attention to the nonverbal communication of others. Don't just take all the words as literal. Second, recognize that nonverbal messages are sometimes difficult to understand. So pay attention to them, but always verify that what you think the nonverbal means is what it means. Third, take stock of your own nonverbal behavior. What behaviors do you have that create certain impressions or people or give away your mood when it's important maybe not to express it? My final advice is that there's no better nonverbal to get you through life, whether it be work, home, family, romantic relationships, than a smile. I hope this information has been helpful, and my best advice to you is to always pay attention to the nonverbals.